everyone, my name is Jake. I'm one of the pastors here at Candeo. Thank you so much for joining us on our live stream of our service this morning. We hope that it serves to be a blessing for you, that as you listen to the message, as you engage in the singing, that your affections for Jesus would just grow and grow and grow. If you're joining us and you aren't part of a local church, wherever you are at, we would really encourage you to find a church in your location where you can be around fellow believers in your community and be cared for by a local team of shepherds who can know you and care for you. If you're in the Cedar Valley and you don't have a church home, or maybe you call Candeo your home, but you have yet to join us uh, for our in-person services, we would love to see you on a Sunday morning. We think that there's something unique about the gathered body of believers in a particular location. And so we would love to gently encourage you to get up off the couch and come join us in person uh, so that we can continue to love and minister one another together. Again, thanks so much for joining us. We hope that this service is a blessing to you. Good morning, church. Would you stand with us today as we worship the Lord together? Psalm 100 invites us into worship this morning, saying, enter the presence of the Lord with singing, enter his gates with thanksgiving, and enter his courts with praise, because the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to gather together and remind ourselves of the steadfast love of the Lord, that Christ would lay his life down for our sin, and that is why we worship him today. So we invite you to join us, lift your voice, and sing to the Lord with us.
taken by my Jesus on the cross. And as far as east and west, I'll see his righteousness. My sins and I. celebrate the Lord. Yeah, sometimes it feels weird to like clap and uh, maybe some of you are here this morning, why do we clap at the end of songs? Uh, it's not because we think it sounds good. Uh, I just want you to know that the, the Bible actually tells us that we can praise the Lord with loud claps. Like that's actually one of the things that the psalmist tells us, tells us to come and shout to the Lord tells us to come and praise him with loud singing and uh, strings and harps and lyres and all these instruments. Even at one point, it says to praise the Lord with loud clashing cymbals. Uh, And so we use all these things to praise the Lord. And we don't have drums today, otherwise we would be praising him with loud clashing cymbals. But uh, I think it's good to remind us why we gather and sing together. And before uh, we continue singing, I'm going to read a psalm. But before even that, I was reminded uh, the last couple of weeks I heard someone talking about why it is that we gather and sing together. Uh, And it's not because we think the music sounds good, uh, though I hope you think the music sounds good. You know, that's that's great. But that's not why we sing. And we don't sing because we like every song or uh, it's our musical preference. Uh, We don't even sing because we had a great week or because we got in our Bible every day this week and we're feeling spiritually really healthy. But the reason that we gather and sing is because Jesus has given us a song a song of redemption, a song of all that he has done for us on the cross, a song of who he is, the holy lamb of God and what he's done, taking all of our sins away. And so before we continue singing, I wanna read Psalm 33, it says this. It says to shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous, praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre and make melody to him with the harp of 10 strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. That's what we're gonna do. I hear, the, I hear you, kid, shouting to the Lord. I love it. Amen. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap and he puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. This is the God that we sing to, the one who by the word of his mouth created the heavens and the earth. And there's good news for you today that the same God who spoke creation into being spoke your salvation into being. Jesus Christ on the cross, his last words, it is finished. He put death to death and laid sin in the grave. And so that is why we stand and worship today. That is the song that we sing, a song of who he is, the righteousness of God, the holy lamb of God and what he has done, not just in creation, 
but in our salvation, secure because of Christ, not because of who we are. So let's continue to worship as we sing of all that he's done. Your words spoke to the darkness, the universe replied, your will be done, your will be done. The heavens and creation responded to your breath, your Your kingdom come, Father, let your rule come and reign. Your kingdom come, Son of glory, come raise the dead. In open heaven's gates, Spirit, have your way. And let your kingdom come. As you spoke my party, you drank the bitter cup, the work was done. Your king. 
Go ahead and meet someone around you.
All right, good morning, Candeo Church. You guys can take a seat. All right, my name is Jordan Perhoda. I'm the community ministry director. This is Asher Gray Perhoda, and uh, Candeo Kids is being remodeled, so he's up here with me right now. And uh, we're going to talk about Candeo Kids this morning, so we figured we'd have some show and tell. Uh, but if you're uh, new this morning, I uh, want to welcome you. We'd encourage you to fill out the back of that program, take it back to the welcome space. We'd love to meet you. Also, if you want to, we're starting our three-week gathering called Launch Point right after this service, uh, 1015 up in the chapel. We'd love for you to join us, even if you haven't signed up. So uh, we'd love to see you there. But the main reason I'm up here this morning is to introduce you to the woman to my right, your left. Uh, this is Chris Nee, and she is our new Candeo Kids ministry leader. Yes. Yes. We are excited. Uh, you started about a month ago in June, which was a perfect time because we threw a grenade in your whole Candeo Kids area, and uh, you're trying to figure that all out right now. But why don't you start, Chris, by telling us a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, good morning. My husband, Dave, and I moved to Waterloo. It will be five years in August. We attended Candeo, and we're still here. So we have four adult children, our youngest being Molly, who is in the Waterloo School District and also attends Candeo. We have two grandsons. They are 12 and 6. All right. So here's the deal. You've got, like, all of Candeo Church sitting in front of you right now. So if you were to say anything to our church family as you step on as Candeo Kids Ministry Leader, what would you say? All right. Well, first, I want to hear from the kids. If you are fifth grade, down to babies, I want you to stand up. Parents, hold your babies up, and I want to hear from you. You are going to say, I love Candeo kids on the count of three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Yes. All right. Okay. Do you believe them, Jordan? I don't know. Asher was unimpressed, but I think I, it was yeah. okay. It was okay. Uh, we're going to do it again. I know again. you can say it louder. Are you ready? One, two, three. Yes. We're there now. Yes. At the mountaintop. <laughs> and I love Candeo Kids. I can't wait for it to reopen on August 7th. First, a shout out to Van Zook and his crew. Yes. They are doing a fantastic job. I walk through there every day. I walk through there this morning. We have new carpet. We have new paint. We have cupboards coming in, and we've got some new rooms. They are just doing a fantastic job. It looks great, and I can't wait to reopen on August 7th. So I started in Candeo Kids four years ago. I felt the responsibility to serve my church in some capacity. And I came along beside Molly, and we were working in the four-year-old room. And once again, I haven't left. So actually, Jordan, that's where I met Casey. Yeah. yeah and that's where room. our friendship began, yeah. was right there in that four-year-old classroom. In fact, I think that's even the first time I met you face-to-face. Yeah, -face. I think so, yep. Mm -hmm. So you get to meet some great people back there. As well as I get my grandma feels on. So we have our two grandsons are over three hours away. We hardly ever get to see them. So I have all kinds of grandkids now. It is just wonderful. And because I've served in there long enough, they are, some of them are even seven and will come up and give Miss Chris a hug. And it is the greatest feeling. It is absolutely the greatest feeling. So this is a call out to you grandparents. We need you to come along beside these kids and teach them their greatest joy in Jesus. I can't imagine a more fulfilling place to serve than to love on these kids and come along beside their parents. All right, so if whether they're grandparent or any age, if they want to serve in Candeo Kids, whether that's playing with kids or holding Babies like Asher Gray. I don't know if you want to hold Asher. He's getting heavy. Uh, he doesn't turn down meals. So he's like, man, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if they want to, to serve back in Candeo Kids, how do they sign up? All right. So if you look in here, there's this little square, and it is called a UR code, correct? QR. QR. Oh, man, Chris, QR. you even practiced it. Oh, <laughs> is a QR code? 
You're all right. Technology. It's all right. So use your phone. If you're not good on technology, put it right there, and Condeo Church will pop right up to the volunteer. Otherwise, you can go to CondeoChurch.com. There's a tab at the top. It says uh, events and sign up, okay? We need you to sign up sooner rather than later because in order to serve, you need to do your application, and we need to do a background check. And we want those rooms full of volunteers and ready to go on August 7th. So it isn't just grandparents. We need you. We need parents. We need singles. We need college. And if you have served in the past, we are going to be sending out an email this week to you. Some of you have taken a hiatus. Some of you are choosing to serve in other places, which is fine. Some of you have served in other places and have spoken to me and want to come to Candeo Kids. So we need to know that you want to serve what service, what time, whether it's monthly or every other week or whatever. But, you know, Jordan, it's going to be the place to be is back in Candeo Kids because we are going to have so much fun. You are going to want to serve every Sunday because these kids are going to be so excited to come in. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for all that. Welcome aboard the team. And, uh, yeah, we are excited to get Candeo Kids going, uh, hopefully within the next month or so or something like that. So uh, that's it for, for announcements. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to turn our attention to the screen as we hear uh, God's word read over us, and then Cody's going to teach us uh, from Psalms this morning. Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, Most High, to declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night with a ten-stringed harp and the music of a lyre. For you have made me rejoice, Lord, by what you have done. I will shout for joy because of the works of your hands. How magnificent are your works, Lord! How profound your thoughts! A stupid person does not know, a fool does not understand this, though the wicked sprout like grass, and all evildoers flourish. They will be eternally destroyed, but you, Lord, are exalted forever. For indeed, Lord, your enemies, indeed your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You have lifted up my horn like that of a wild ox. I have been anointed with the finest oil. My eyes look at my enemies when evildoers rise against me. My ears hear them. The righteous thrive like a palm tree and grow like a cedar tree in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, healthy and green to declare. The Lord is just, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Well, good morning, Kendo Church. As always, it's amazing to be with you. Uh, I would love for us to pray together before we dive into this text and uh, just cry out for God to be good to us in this time. Can we do that? Let's pray. Um, Jesus, I stand here feeling so incredibly inadequate. Uh, one, to just justify this text and to teach the full beauty of this text and the, the time that we're going to give it. Um, but God, I also just feel my brokenness this morning. I uh, feel the, the reality of my just flawed nature. And I'm asking for you to, to fill me up and to speak powerfully by the power of your spirit and for your glory, not mine. I also pray for everybody in here this morning, Lord, that we would be open to what you have to speak to us as a people and that you would give us soft hearts that would be receptive and would be ready to then apply what we hear. And so would you stir our affections in a fresh way today for you and because of your great glory and goodness, God. Amen. Amen. All right, if you got a Bible, I want you in Psalm 92 with us this morning, all right? And when you open to Psalm 92, what you're opening up to, you're opening up to a song that is all about the importance of worship, and most specifically, the importance of a particular aspect of worship, which is singing, which might be confusing for, for some in the room because sometimes these words are used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing necessarily, Okay. When we use the word worship, what we're talking about there is we're talking about like more of a broader term. 
that really every action, every thought, every motive of my life is meant to be used in worship to God. All of life is worship. It's a broader term. When we talk about singing, though, we're talking about the particular expression of worship where we actually open our mouths and declare the goodness of God. We declare his praise. And what this psalm is getting to is not just a call to worship, it's a call specifically to singing. So I'm going to ask your forgiveness here on the front end. I don't know. This could totally bomb. But I've been watching a lot of Dude Perfect with my boys. Uh, Hopefully there's some in the room that they can relate to. But like Dude Perfect, one of the things that they do is not only like really cool trick shots, which I'm sure takes a billion takes for them to actually get that to happen. They make it look like it's flawless and and so easy, but it's not. But they also now have like a channel where they do other things. Have you guys followed this? Okay, so stereotypes is one of the things that they do. And I couldn't help but like as I was preparing this message, just to think about some of like the Sunday morning uh, singing stereotypes that I will see. And this isn't meant to like poke too hard like at anybody, but just to be playful and fun. So don't, don't, please don't get offended. I don't want hate emails. All right. So, um, but there are on a Sunday morning, some st- stereotypes that take place during the time of singing uh, here. And, uh, and I want to just highlight a few of my favorites. All right. So here's, here's my first one. Maybe some of you are like, oh, I'm busted. Uh, my, my favorite stereotype, my first one, is what I would refer to as like the coffee mumbler, which the beauty of this is the coffee answers the most foundational question in your mind when it comes to singing, which is, what do I do with my hands? And so what you've got with the coffee mumbler is you've got like this pose nailed, <laughs> right? And like, it's just you, Jesus, and your coffee. And as long as that coffee's there, like you're totally good. And I see you, like you're like, you're bouncing your, your knee just a bit. Like I see you, and you're just kind of mumbling over the top of that. And it almost looks like you're either singing or blowing, you know, the steam of your coffee. But like stereotype number one is like the coffee mumbler. And some of you are like busted. But it does answer the question of like, what do I do with my hands? Now, the second stereotype you're, you've kind of figured it out, like, and this is the stereotype that I most often fall into because when you're going like, well, what do I do with my hands? There's the coffee mumbler. There's also the Alanis Morissette. Here's what I mean. Remember Alanis Morissette? This, like, only 10% of you will get this. But her best song, maybe her only song that any of us would ever know is the song One Hand in My Pocket. Because I got one hand in my pocket and the other one is giving... Jesus, a high five. I don't know how the song actually goes, but I think that's what we think is like, this will be my my stereotype that I fall into. And then what it helps you out with is then your friends don't think that you're weird, right? Because you're standing there and you want to be all in. You want to put your hands up in worship, but you're like, I'm going to go half in and half out. That way I don't have to like answer questions we're in the car driving home. Like I just, we'll do that. Like, so you got the coffee mumbler, you got the Alanis Morissette. Um, The third stereotype that we see is like, the just me and Jesus person. Like you got rid of the coffee. It's just you and Jesus. And what I mean when I talk about this stereotype is you are what all of us are in the shower. You are that on a Sunday morning. Like you are singing like no one else can hear you. And you are all in and expressive. Like you're the only one in the room. And it's all about for you, the personal experience of just you and Jesus, which is so much that's beautiful about that. But there is a really important part that's missing. And I want to hit that this morning. So you got the coffee mumbler, you got the Alanis Morissette. Hey, by the way, when I say Alanis Morissette, how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Throw your hand up. Gosh, okay. <laughs> oh, I'm going to put that in the swing and miss category. I don't know what I'm going to do in the 11 o'clock service. Sorry. 1030 service, I forget what time it is. All right. Uh, wow, where was I? All right. The next stereotype, uh, some of you are gonna, gonna feel busted on this one, uh, is the stereotype that I'm gonna call like the I'm just here for the message group, okay? Your perfect Sunday would be if, if life just worked out, right? Because you don't wanna be guilty of doing this purposefully, but if life just works out that like you can kind of slide into service a little bit late and slide out just a tad early. Like if, if that's how the world would play out for a day, that is your perfect day because really, you're just here for the, the message. And, and in your mind sometimes what the singing can be is it's like this is just the warm-up for the message. That's like what we're doing here, right, is we're just singing a little bit to kind of like warm up our hearts to be ready for the message. That's, that's it. And it's like, ah, uh, it's, 
That's, a, that's not the truth. And Psalm 92 is going to address that. And then there's, there's this stereotype, which I think, I think is the most important one for us because it, it, it brings us to a really important question. Um, but the last stereotype I, I want to hit on is, is the stereotype. It's a group of people that are, that are standing here while we're singing, and they're just looking around the room going, what is happening right now? And the reason I love this stereotype, and if that's you this morning, I'm so glad that you're here because you're asking the question that many in the room who have just grown up going to church, we've probably forgotten to ask, which is why do we sing so much? Like, why do we sing so much? I mean, name another environment in our culture where we will gather in mass and spend extended time just singing together. Like every Sunday when we gather, about half of our time is spent singing. Why? Like, is it because we're convinced that the church service needs to go at least an hour and so to fill time and you don't want to hear me talk for the whole time? You're like, well, let's sing for a while and kind of like fill it in, you know? So is, is singing just filler? Um, are we singing like, like this is kind of what the ladies like to do, so we're just singing for the ladies, you know? Like, this would be great. Or, or is this just church tradition? Is that why we're singing? Like, what are we doing here? That's what Psalm 92 addresses. When God speaks to us through his word this morning, he will answer the why question, why do we sing so much? And that is the most important question that we can ask and answer is, is the why question. So that's what we're going to go after today. All right. So verse one, the psalmist says this, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name most high, to declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night with a ten-stringed harp and the music of a lyre. Right there, right, at, right away he says, it is good to give thanks. It is good to sing praise. It is good to declare God's faithfulness. Or if you want to put it another way, the negative sense, it is bad not to give thanks. It is bad not to sing praise. It is bad not to declare God's faithful love. And answering the question of why do we sing, the first thing that we get here in this passage is, why do we sing? Because it's good. It's good too. This brings us back to something really elementary because I have this conversation all the time with my kids. Parents, maybe you can relate, but I'll often sit down with my children and get down to eye level with them and just go, okay, do you want to do what is good or do you want to do what is bad? Right? Not meant to be a rhetorical question, but it is an important question. When it comes to singing, he says it is good to sing. So as Christ fathers, the first thing we got to hear, do you want to do what is good or what is bad? The word good here literally means it's appropriate to sing. It's the right thing to do to sing. So I want to zoom out just a little bit. I'm just going to pause here, zoom out, and I want to address a common barrier to singing. And I, and I want to approach even just not just the, the topic of singing. I want to talk about worship for a little bit because one of the most popular barriers to singing, uh, it goes bigger than just singing. It, it goes back to worship. Um, but one of the most popular barriers is just this lie that circulates through our churches and and even in this room, that, well, I'm, I'm just not like a, a worship person. I'm not really an expressive person. Um, I don't, I, guys, I, I, this, this whole thing, like, it's not really my personality. Like, this isn't how I am. Like, God didn't make me this way. I connect with God in other ways, but not this way. That often for people is like the biggest barrier when it comes to worship, particularly worship through singing. And I want to just address that, that real quick. And I want to put this important line in your mind. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Guys, you must understand that it is not a question of if we worship, but what we worship. That's true for everybody. It's not a matter of if we worship, but what we worship. If you want some proof of this and you want to have a fun afternoon, uh, go home today, go onto YouTube and just type in crazy fan videos. 
uh, hours of entertainment, okay, hours of entertainment. I, I can speak from experience. I uh, spent a day doing this. Um, some popular searches, if you want to have one, like try out Justin Bieber, um, uh, One Direction. I didn't realize what a crazy mob following they have. Uh, but for me, probably the most memorable video that I saw, of, like crazy fan videos that proved this point, that it's not a matter of if we worship, but what we worship, was Michael Jackson. It's a little bit dated. All right, I did Alanis Morissette earlier. Everybody know who like, Michael Jackson is? If you know who he is, can we throw our hands up? Okay, great. All right, now I'm speaking of something we all get, okay? This one video that I saw of Michael Jackson, like guys, it was insane watching people. And it was like men, women, like this, I'm not talking about like teenagers, I'm talking about like grown up individuals mobbing cars, shaking them back and forth, screaming, crying constantly, rushing the stage when they weren't supposed to. Even at one point, the craziest thing I saw was like Michael Jackson was like up in this like three-story building and there's a crowd outside chanting his name. And all he did is he took like that like glove that he wears and he just like waved. They didn't see his face or anything. They just saw his hand wave and a woman fainted. Like right on the sidewalk, just like passed out. It's not a matter of if we worship, but what we worship. And some of the people that would say, I'm not a very expressive person. And they would use that and they would hide behind that on a Sunday morning is the same person that would be caught in other environments like a football stadium dressed up in their team colors and screaming until they don't even have a voice. Or if it's not sports that's your thing, it's when a certain politician walks into the room, that's when you lose your mind. Or you lose your mind over, and really your wallet over, new technology, clothing, cars, video games, smoker grills. Gentlemen, can we talk about Pellet grills, can we do that? We lose our minds about things, about stuff. So you must understand, like this is a truth at the core of it all, is that God made us this way. God made us to be worshipers. He created us. It's in our nature to worship. It's natural for us to do so. We're created to get excited about something. We're created to orient our lives around something. We're created to orient our emotions around something. We're created to open our mouths and to celebrate something. And so the problem for us isn't that we aren't worshipers. We can't stop worshiping even if we wanted to. The problem is that our worship is often misguided. And so what Psalm 92 is laboring for is not only to like redirect our worship back to God, but he's calling us to sing as an expression of that worship. And this passage is not alone in the Bible in calling us to sing. In the Bible that you have there in front of you, you can find over 400 references to singing. And on top of that, another 50 direct commands to sing. As God's people, singing is not optional. It's good for us to sing. It's appropriate for us to sing. And we must understand that worship and then worship with expression behind it, where we open our mouths and declare and celebrate and all that, is a natural thing for us. I'm kind of curious, what do you worship? Who do you worship? Who do you sing out to? What do you cry out to in our world? So it's good for us to sing, but he's going to continue to answer this question of why we sing. And when he goes into verses 4 and 5, the psalmist really highlights what fuels our singing, what makes singing the most appropriate response. This is what he says in verse 4, for you have made, catch that word, circle that, you have made me rejoice, Lord. I just want to pause because I want to ask the question, like, like how did God do this? How did God, if I... If I I take uh, the psalmist is talking about like I was at one time this non-worshipping boulder that was stuck on a hill. How did God at some point dislodge him and get him rolling down the singing hill, down the worshipping hill? How did that happen? God, you have made me rejoice, Lord, by, keyword, by what you have done. And I will shout for joy, another keyword, because of the works of your hands. 
It's been God's works that have dislodged him and caused him to worship. He says in verse 5, how magnificent are your works, Lord, and how profound your thoughts. What fuels the psalmist's worship and what's meant to fuel our worship are the works of God. The works of God. And he also talks about the thoughts of God being worshipful. And it's not just about worshiping God's works or his thoughts, but the reality that God's thoughts and his works are the overflow of who he is. It's the overflow of his nature. Just like for us, that our thoughts and our works are the overflow of who we are. When we see God's works, when we see his thoughts and comprehend his thoughts, we're able to see who God is in his nature. And so the worship is not about the works. It's not about just the thoughts. It's about who God is. So I just want to ask you a question. I'm going to give some genuine space here. When we talk about the works of God that fuel our worship, can I just ask you, like, what's the greatest work of God you've experienced that fuels your worship? I'll just ask that again in case you miss it. What is the greatest work of God that you've experienced that fuels your worship? My first thought of like this question and, and answering it myself, I thought first of just the beauty of creation. Like I think of Iowa sunsets. I think of the times that I've spent in the mountains or the times I've spent on like white sand beaches, whether it's Florida or even like I go back to a time I spent in Thailand at one point, just those moments, right, where like, it, like no camera, like you can't pull up your phone and take a picture because like there's no way that a camera could fully capture what you're seeing. And like there's no way for you to even like put it into words. Like you can't even describe it to somebody else like what you saw. And even your mind itself like couldn't even fully comprehend like what you were actually looking at. And so you just were stuck in a place of awe for hours scared to even like leave that moment because it's like, I don't even know how to take this with me. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like those breathtaking moments that just remind you of your smallness, God's greatness. When I think about God's works, I think about creation. Scott Rieger, a friend of mine and, and fellow elder, we were hanging out just a few weeks ago and he had just gotten back from a trip to California to Yosemite and then seeing like the gigantic giant sequoias out there and you know, we were just reflecting on just the beauty of creation, and, and he pointed to this verse. I love this. It was Job 26, 14 that says all of these things, these works and these ways that we see, like, these are but the fringes of God's great works. Like, like what we're celebrating that is so beautiful, even in this broken world that we live in, is so beautiful. These are just the, the fringes. When I think about God's great works, I think about that. I also think, though, about... Um, just the undeserved grace of God on my life that I experience in like my health, friendships, like my beautiful wife and incredible kids, like just the joy of life that I look at and all around me, I'm like, I'm like I don't deserve this. I am blessed beyond anything I could ever deserve. I look at that, I'm like, those are incredible works that causes me to worship but remember the question I asked you, I said, what's the greatest work that you've experienced that fuels your worship? And I would say creation, those other things that I mentioned, those aren't it. Because honestly, you could take all those things away from me and I would still have reason to worship. My worship's not attached to those things. So great gifts, great works of God. Because the greatest work of God that I've experienced in my life and many of you have experienced is the miracle of redemption. Like, I relate so much to the blind man in John 9. You guys remember that story? Jesus encounters a man that was born blind in John chapter 9, and he heals him. And it creates quite a fuss because he heals him on the Sabbath day, which there were some people at that time named Pharisees did not think that that was a good thing to do, which is ridiculous. Um, Jesus knew that. That was ridiculous. 
So what happens is they can't find Jesus, but they find this man that was blind that Jesus said, hey, put some mud on your eyes and all this, and then he can see. And they bring him in, and they put him on trial of sorts. And the same people that ended up killing Jesus, they've got this man cornered. They're like peppering him with questions. <laughs> and, and he just looks at them at one point. He's totally exasperated. Like, I don't really know what else to tell you guys. Like, I don't know the answers to all of the questions that you're throwing at me. All I know is I was once blind and now I see. And what I love about his story and his simple testimony is it's just a reminder that, guys, genuine faith, even genuine faith, sometimes has some questions, some doubts, some things. It's like, I don't know the answer to that. I will tell you today, even though I'm standing up here serving as a pastor of the church, I don't have answers to every question that you've got or that I've got about life and this world and all the things in it or whatever. And you could ask me that. You can back me into a corner. There may even be moments of doubt. I'm just telling you, though, at the end of it, what holds me in, what keeps me secure, what keeps me worshiping is this one miracle that I cannot deny, and that is at one point in my life, I was blind, and now I see. And you could take everything else away from me, and you could tell me a bunch of things that I can and cannot do, but the one thing I would never stop doing because of that miracle in my life is I would never stop singing. I can't. God has done something in me that I cannot describe. It's hard for me even to put into words. It's an absolute miracle. The miracle of redemption. That's the greatest work of God in my life. And I know many of you know what I'm talking about. This incredible work of God is the overflow of who he is. So I want to just go back into the first few verses there because he's talking about, this isn't just a reflection of like God's work in redemption. It's just a reflection of who he is and God is faithful. It's good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing the praise most high, to declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. And a word what we're celebrating is just who God is when we sing his faithfulness, his continued faithfulness to a unfaithful and flawed people. And what the psalmist is encouraging us to do is to have a pattern where we wake up in the morning and immediately we hit our knees and thank God that his mercies are new every morning. God, I thank you that every morning I wake up, your rich grace is here in full supply. And then as we go through our day, that we would also end the day. In the morning, I think about this, and at the end of the day, I celebrate your faithfulness because now I can look back with one more day of evidence of how you sustain, how you provide, how you care. And this just being the rhythm of life in the morning and at night, celebrating your faithfulness. Now stay with me because we're going to see this on more full display even within our text. But uh, I want to keep moving with the flow of this text. Because if you look at this from like the 30,000 foot view and just look at this text from the top down, there's kind of three parts. Verses 1 through 3 is part 1 that says it's good to sing. Part two is verses four and five. It says it's appropriate to sing because of all that God has done. And then the rest of the text, verses six through 15, highlight a contrast between two things. Here's the start of the contrast. Verse six, a stupid person does not know and a fool does not understand this. He's not mincing words here. This is not politically correct language. I get that. The psalmist is just pointing out that there are sadly many people in the world that though God's great works are on full display, they are unable to see it or acknowledge it. And there's a lot of stupid people out there. I think it's here, this is a little bit of like a side note, but this is a really important side note. Guys, I think it's here that you recognize that our silence when we should be singing does say more about us than we realize. Our silence when we should be singing says more about us than we realize, about the condition of our hearts and where we are. Because a stupid person, they can see these works, or in some way they're on full display in front of them, but they don't erupt. They don't have this volcanic eruption of praise that takes place. And that's sad. And he keeps going with the contrast. Though the wicked sprout like grass and evildoers flourish, they will be eternally destroyed. But you, Lord, are exalted forever. The first 
dozen times I read this text, I thought the contrast was between the stupid person, the wicked person, the foolish person, the evildoer, that crowd, and then go to verse 12, the righteous person. That's a common contrast that scriptures give us. It's between the foolish person and the righteous person, or the, the evil person and the righteous person. I thought that's what we were getting into here, and I, I just in the last few days, I'm like, I don't think I'm reading this right. I think actually the contrast, though there is some contrast there, I think it actually begins someplace different, and a contrast between those who will be eternally destroyed and the one who will be eternally exalted. That's why these two things are back to back. It's not a contrast of righteous people and wicked people. It's a contrast between those who will be eternally destroyed and him who will be exalted forever. That's why those things are back to back there. You can see it right there in verses 6 and 7. And we live in a time when the stupid, when the wicked, when the evildoers, when the, the foolish, they're, they're flourishing. I'm just telling you, Christian, you may be suffering now and the evildoers flourishing that will not be like that for much longer. And I'm not saying that because I know that Jesus is going to come back tomorrow and to judge the world and establish the new heavens and the new earth. I'm, I don't know if that's tomorrow or many, many years from now. All I'm saying is that in comparison, relative to eternity, the flourishing of evil is a blip. That's all. And I want to focus first on this contrast between God who's eternally exalted and the wicked who are going to be eternally destroyed. I want to create the contrast there because if we jump too quickly and look at then the righteous crowd versus the wicked crowd and go, all right, my side, I'm on the winning team and they're on the losing team. All of a sudden our ego starts getting puffed up and we start thinking that we earned something. We're doing something awesome. We're an incredible people. Let me just ask you this. I just want to go back and just marinate on the gospel here again, people. How did you get here? If you're on the winning side, on the righteous side, what did you do to get here? That E-O-U-S ending of a word means full of. So when he talks about the righteous, he's saying these people are full of what is right. Be ready for this. If I'm describing you, go ahead and throw your hand up. But if you would say that you are a person where every action you've ever taken was fully right, every word that you've ever spoken was fully right, and every motive behind every action ever taken and every word ever spoken in your life was fully right, if that's you, throw your hand up. We got the Alanis Morissette crowd back again. All right. None of us are righteous. And so we must pause here and recognize there is only one being in the universe who is righteous. And the question that we should be asking ourselves is, how does someone like me become righteous like God? And the beauty of the gospel, again, let's just celebrate this. This is 2 Corinthians 5.21, that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. God took on flesh so he could take on our sin so that by placing our faith in Christ, this incredible exchange takes place where Jesus takes our unrighteousness. This is the deal he offers by faith. I'll take your unrighteousness and give you my righteousness. That's what I accomplished on the cross. And all of a sudden, we stand righteous by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. And the contrast that we have in that, then, is the overflow of God's grace on our lives. What is your story? Have you placed your faith in Christ? Do you believe this? This work, this, this incredible work of Jesus, this great exchange, this is why whispering about God's grace and mumbling it over coffee is not enough for us. We've got to open our mouths and to sing. It deserves that. And now we can see this, this contrast because we are planted in Christ. This, this new contrast emerges between grass in verse 7 and something else here in verses 12 and 13. He says this, that the righteous thrive like a palm tree. 
and they grow like a cedar tree in Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They thrive in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, healthy and green, to declare that the Lord is just. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. And now this comparison, this this contrast between grass, cedar trees, and palm trees. Do you know how long it takes to establish a lawn? Like, throw the seed out, it germinates, and you get grass. It takes about two to three weeks. Some of you that have tried that and don't have a lawn yet, I'm sorry. That's just what the internet said. I don't know that from experience. I'm not great at growing grass. So it's supposed to take two to three weeks. Do you know how long it takes to establish a palm tree? Seed to palm tree? 20 years. Cedar trees, 30 years. The contrast here now is between something that rises up quickly. It's flash. It's flashy. looks great. But it can't stand the test of time. And something totally different. A work that starts and it takes a while. And it doesn't look like much, maybe one to two to three years in. Which sometimes as Christians, that can be really frustrating for us. Because what we want is we want instant maturity, instant results, instant fruit. Right, so we get frustrated when we're like three years into life with Christ. And we feel like a lot of days we're not that much different than what we were before. Guys, go talk to a palm tree. It can relate. It gets you. It is hilarious to me that of all of like the metaphors that God could give us about the Christian life and what it looks like to thrive in Jesus, that the the picture that he paints is you'll thrive like a palm tree. You'll thrive like a cedar. Like, really? Because every time I look at a cedar tree year after year, it doesn't look that much different. It's like, yeah, but watch what I'll do over the course of time in that person's life. If they stay planted in good soil, watch what will happen. Christian, if you look a lot like you did maybe a year ago and you're discouraged by that, my encouragement to you is don't quit. Don't quit. God is at work and doing something miraculous in you. What will be special is what you look like 30 years from now. If you remain fixed in the Lord's presence. Look where the cedar trees and palm trees are planted. In the courts of God, in the house of God, in his presence, him doing the work, him continuing to sustain and to work, he is doing that work. So I go back to the question I asked at the very beginning, why do we sing? Why do we sing? Here's what I want you to understand. Guys, the reason that we sing and why we sing is because we have to continue to find ways to fix our eyes on Christ and to fix our minds, thoughts on Christ. And there's nothing quite like a song to do that. We sing because we need to continue to fix our hearts on Christ And continue to steer our affections toward Christ and keep ourselves centered on Christ. So there's nothing quite like a song to move our hearts to do that. We sing because nothing celebrates the beauty of God, who he is and what he has done quite like a song. And we sing because there's nothing quite like a song that helps us endure and stay faithful over the long haul of life quite like a song. My biggest takeaway in reading Psalm 92 is the importance of singing and my perseverance as a believer in Christ. I'm telling you, Christian, if today you are singing and someday you are not, that is a bad thing. If you look at the top of this psalm, it says that this was a psalm for the Sabbath day. This was a psalm written to help direct God's people when they gather that on a weekly basis when they would gather together, that this was to encourage what they would do. And God was building into the rhythms of his people the importance of you need to continue to gather, continue to sing, continue to redirect your heart's affections because I know that your hearts are prone to wander and there's nothing like singing, there's nothing like a song to continue to move your minds and your hearts and your lives back to its appropriate place to being fixed on Christ. You need to sing 
if you want to persevere in your faith. It is essential for that. But it's not just about me singing so that I stay strong. It's it's not the me and Jesus thing. I said there was an important part that's missing in the Jesus and me person's worship. And it's this, it's Colossians 3.16 that lets us know that we are to let the word of Christ dwell richly among us. And in all wisdom, we should be teaching and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. When I sing, it's not just for me. I sing for you, for my encouraged or discouraged brother or sister to my left that will be encouraged and sharpened and comforted by my words, that God is speaking through me as I worship. And in the same way, you're singing for me. And together as we're singing, we're building one another up in Christ. And so I look at my life, guys, I'm about half done if you go with what the average male lives to uh, in America, which means I've got roughly 2,100 Sundays left in my life if I live that long. And what I praise God for is that I look forward to 2,100 Sundays where God will continue to bring me together with his people. God willing, I'll stay with his people Because I need the church. I need the songs of the saints to continue to keep my faith and my love for Jesus fresh. God gave that to us as a gift, the gift of song, the gift of Sabbath, the gift of coming together. I know I'm over time. I want to say one more thing here. uh, Because there's a beautiful word in here to uh, those who are older in age. I didn't know where to put this. Molly, you can't slap your dad's leg when that happens. Uh, (laughs) Totally busted on that. I just just want to say this. um, And I don't know, I didn't know where to put it, but I want to just speak this word because I think this is an important thing for those who are older in age. And I'll let you define whether that applies to you or not, Dave. If you want to let that apply. Um, Because look what he says there in verse 14. Planted in the house of the Lord, they thrive in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age, right? And what's the demonstration that they're still bearing fruit and in a good place? They're healthy, green, and they're declaring. This psalm starts with singing, ends with singing. And you got those who are older in age who are still declaring, the Lord is just, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. I just want to say to those who are older in age, please understand this. God's work in your life is not done yet. You are still able to bear fruit. And I know that we are a church that celebrates, and I believe rightly so, God's work among the next generation. There is nothing quite like seeing new life spring up out of the ground. A a young palm tree, you know, emerge from the ground. There's nothing quite like that. So I love celebrating God's work in the next generation. I'm just telling you, as a person in my late 30s, there's nothing to me more inspiring than to see the vibrancy of faith in those in an older generation. Those who have lived long years and still stand there and say, the Lord has been good to us. One of our members had a stroke two weeks ago after service. Went out for lunch, had a stroke, nearly died. He's still with us. I sat in his house a few days after that, him and his wife. He's now in a very different state than where he once was. He's not all there. And though he's able to engage through facial expressions to some degree, whatever, he's lost the ability to talk. Things have changed quite a bit now for James and Gloria. And to sit there and to hear her put into words that phrase, The Lord has been good to us and is being good to us. Guys, that was the greatest encouragement I've received in probably the past year. And she didn't even say it for me. She was just declaring the Lord's goodness in her life. Seeing palm trees 
cedar trees that are mature and still vibrant and bearing fruit inspires me to continue to want to grow myself, to stay rooted in Christ myself, and to see those who are older in generation bearing fruit and then declaring, singing themselves and leading out in this environment in song. It's the greatest gift that your generation can give to us as a church and to me and my family. I just wanted to give you that word. Can I pray for us? Jesus, thank you for your word this morning, for the beauty of your gathered church and the power of a song. And I thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done among us that inspires us, that fuels us to worship, which we will celebrate here, the Lord's Supper. Your goodness, it's indescribable. Your faithfulness, it knows no ends. And so we worship you, Jesus, and celebrate you above all things. Amen. Church, a symbol of the gift of Jesus for us that purchased for us our righteousness. But the body and blood of Christ that was broken for us and the blood that was spilled for us. And so we're going to take this together as an act of worship. And so if you're a believer in Christ, you put your faith in Christ, this is for you. If you've yet to do that, please just sit out and observe this. But... To my brothers and sisters this morning, I'm going to invite you to first take out the bread, which represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. As we take this together, would this be an opportunity for us to redirect our hearts away from other things that we worship toward Christ, who is who we should only worship? Can we take this together? And in the same way, we take the cup that symbolizes the blood of Christ poured out for us. Let's take this together. Amen. Would you stand with us as we respond in singing together? Ground, he's by. 
Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. We stand this morning in the power of Christ, not our own righteousness, but covered in the righteousness of Jesus who laid his life down for us. We sing and we respond to that truth, declaring all that he's done for us. We're just gonna sing one more song together. Would you lift your voices, everything we have, declaring this truth, this grace from the Lord. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep
more time we sing. Praise God from all blessings flow. Praise the Lord together. Amen. Zephaniah 317 says that the Lord rejoices over you with loud singing. And so, Kante, as we leave this place, we get to be image bearers of a God who sings over us by singing back to him the truth of his word. So go and let your songs and your lives be evidence of that truth today. We love you. We'll see you back next week.